for being with us today. I'm Kimberly Weefling. I'm a physicist by education and for the last 20 years have been consulting with people, helping them achieve what seems impossible, but is merely difficult. I saw something published by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development about 10 years ago, saying that we're on a path for by the year 2045 to have over 9 billion people on planet Earth and they will require 2.3 Earths were the resources to support them in the lifestyle that they wish to live. This caused me concern. So I am delighted that I found Society 2045 that's envisioning a society that actually works for human beings in the year 2045, seeking to change the way society works, bringing together people on the leading edges of individual social and systems evolution movements. And I get hope from this group. Today, you're gonna to hear from my wonderful friend, Mark Roost, who is helping contribute to a sustainable world for all. Mark, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you. I was born into a family of intellectuals with strong progressive values. My father was a sociologist, anthropologist, and political scientist, and a leader in the Theosophical Society, which pioneered bringing Eastern philosophy to the West. He was born in Vlardingen, Holland, and came from a long line of ship's captains. My mother was raised in Portland, Oregon, where she started salons to help whites, blacks, and Chinese meet and understand each other. She was raised by a single mom who had lived with gypsies and learned to earn a living with promistry along, other, along with other skills. Her father was a mining engineer who worked mostly in Canada and Alaska. During World War II, my father ran Allied shipping in Sydney Harbor and was General MacArthur's translator. My mother taught 10,000 B-17 tail gunners at a time about American history and why we were in the war at Kingman Army Airfield in Arizona. As, that war, as the war neared a close, they were both sent to military government school to prepare to serve in the occupation government in Japan. After the war, my father was MacArthur's chief of political affairs, and my mother taught Japanese women's groups how to mobilize women to vote in the national elections for the first time in history. They and most of and the rest of the military government team MacArthur assembled were passionately devoted to bringing democracy to Japan. My father wrote the civil rights and responsibilities section of the new Japanese constitution with my mother's advice on the women's rights section. My brothers and I grew up surrounded by Japanese art and learned stories of their work. My father introduced me to economic geography at age 10. It showed up about 35 years later when I did a conceptual design of an environmental, economic, and land use planning knowledge base for designing sustainable economies. I was part of the anti-war movement from my freshman year of college until the Vietnam War ended. I took Bucky Fuller's lecture course in comprehensive design science in the spring of my freshman year and never looked back. Buckminster Fuller, what an amazing person and how inspiring is that? Thank you for sharing a bit about your life. Uh, I'm sure you have some amazing dreams and hopes for the year 2045. What is your vision for 2045, if anything were possible? Well, the best way to predict the future is to make it happen. I'm here to help people live in harmony with each other and all their relations. As true radical Bucky Fuller put it, prosperity for all without insult to nature. Our company, Sustainable Energy Inc's mission is to end the use of fossil fuels by 2030, displacing them technically and financially and allying with the movements that are working to end their social license morally. We will support sustainable economic development of indigenous cultures where they want it starting with renewable energy and information and communication technologies, or ICTs. On the way to 2030, we will use the technical and financial opportunity to support global design of sustainable economies, starting with energy, transportation, construction, the maker movement, and some ICTs. Over the following 15 years, the world will fine tune economic relationships with nature and with the power relationships among people. We will also use a huge government sur global surplus of renewable energy and stationary storage compared to the supposed economic minimum to power both activating natural carbon storage and direct air capture with carbon dioxide 
for use in greenhouses and as chemical feedstocks. Whenever renewable energy input levels fall hard for a long time, the so-called extra energy powering direct air capture can be switched over to make up the difference. What's that called? Resilience. What's that make? Prosperity for all. Well, we'd love to hear more about the technologies, Mark, Mark with an emphasis on what does it mean for a normal human? I mean, a lot of our listeners are not technology people. Just give us a little peek into the technology and especially the benefits that we're going to see when this technology manifests. Okay. Well, the inventor with whom I work, William Todorov, is the world leader in fired multi-crystalline ceramic alloy semiconductor material science. And all the different things he does are essentially applications of that and of aerodynamics and, th and other things. The materials for all these technologies, instead of being like lithium, which is mined in toxic ways and then has to be refined and then has to be processed, we're really talking about grinding up rocks into powder and using them unrefined, other than the wires themselves, which are refined copper or whatever. Um, William started research and, and researching and designing saline-based fired multicrystalline ceramic semiconductor batteries around 20 years ago. He started full-time committed development about nine years ago and has made 14,000 electrodes in a constant exploration and development process. That's more than the 11,000 filaments that Edison researched. Um, we expect to store three to seven times the capacity of lithium batteries per pound. And what that means, I'll give you some examples in a moment. Um, but before that, William also st William started full-time committed solar system development in 1971 and filed a patent for the first multi-junction thin film solar designed for volume production in 1982. It was a multi-crystalline silicon alloy that would form in the kiln making a fast semiconductor, faster than the highly toxic and expensive gallium arsenide. When the patent examiner heard that, he saw it in his mind and granted all 38 claims in 1983. That patent examiner had examined every application for a solar photovoltaic patent that had ever been filed. Now William has improved that design so much that his model says it can reach 48% efficiency, which is twice the best performance of today's rooftop or utility solar panels. And that means it takes half the space to power a truck fleet, for instance, which is what we're heading to. Rather than using rare earth materials, which are used in some lithium batteries, he's designed low cost and high performance substitutes for neodymium for motor magnets, and germanium for concentrating solar photovoltaics. So don't use this stuff, replace it. That's what ceramics does. They learn how to take something that's run out and mix other clays, for instance, together to make something that exactly replaces it. So and from a regular person point of view, it sounds like, okay, we've got to move from fossil fuels to cleaner ways of generating and storing energy, Lithium yep. ion batteries have a yep. lot of drawbacks because of the negative impact of the mining of the lithium and all that. And so it sounds like you're saying, hey, we can make batteries out of sand and we can make more efficient solar voltaics and everything's going to be much better. Why does that matter to the normal human being? Well, because the normal human being would like to live in a planet that has animals and plants and everything living in harmony with each other and with that person instead of something covered with toxic waste spoils. Well, we are certainly on the path to that. So how will you and others fulfill the huge needs of our growing population so that we truly can see an end to fossil fuels by 2030? Well, once we invent the thing, we've already figured out we're inventing it based on a particular way of producing each thing. So for instance, the solar thin film was originally supposed to be made on a $400 million stainless steel rolling mill and there was no money for that. But now he's planning to make it with an inkjet printing press or maybe 3D printing. And um, so we're looking at 60 million kilowatts of electricity uh, 
capability of electricity making capability coming out of a factory every year um, and a fairly inexpensive factory for the batteries instead of these uh, things that you see pictures of at Tesla sometimes we're basically looking at a uh, ceramic floor tile factory that makes 50 million square feet of tile per year in 400 foot long roller kilns where things roll through the kiln and it brings them up to, up to temperature and back down in a very precisely controlled way. We're looking at doing that and making 150 million kilowatt hours of battery capacity per year per factory. And we're gonna go factory after factory. These factories are gonna be cloned basically. We're gonna put factories all over the planet. And that leads to being able to fully displace fossil fuels by 2030 instead of what everybody thinks it's gonna take till 2035 or 2040, 2050. We're looking at the mathematical capability and the physical capability of getting rid of fossil fuels by 2030. Obviously, there's a lot of technical complexity to it, and there are many things to be done along the way and step-by-steps and milestones. Just jump to the future, would you, and just take us into 2045 and imagine that everything you've done and wanted to see happen has fully come to pass. Take us on a little tour of what is 2045 like? What's our life like? What's happening if and when we get to that amazing outcome? Well, for one thing, instead of um, 1.2 billion people on this world not having electricity, we all have electricity, abundant. We all have designed it to get it the most efficiently and with least damage to the planet. Um, we uh, probably all work on growing food uh, in 1900, 90% of the US population was busy growing food. In the late 1890s, Paris was a net exporter of food because people grew it on every available surface in Paris. And they had this nice French biodynamic intensive growing system, which was really, really good and get two people tuned into nature as well, instead of using pesticides and tractors. So, um, so everybody is, and what that's, one of the pieces that makes that possible is a guaranteed income. Um, and that's based on what Bucky talked, which was that if we do things efficiently and well, uh, we have an abundance of what we need for everybody, as long as we do it the right way. Let's give people a little glimpse into Buckminster Fuller, because Amazingly, some people have not heard of him. So if you could just give us a little introduction to Bucky and his philosophy and what he stands for and your experience with him. Okay, well, Bucky was this, a phenomenon. Um, he had had some struggles in life and almost committed suicide once and then decided, no, no, I'm supposed to, to show what I can, what, a difference a human can make by working hard at it. Um, and so he worked really, really hard. You know, like he was a guy who would, you know, work for six hours and take a half hour nap four times a day. And um, he would lecture to tens of thousands of people. Um, when I took his course in the spring of 1966 at San Jose State, we had the largest auditorium on campus for the lecture course. And that auditorium wasn't only filled, all the aisles were filled with people sitting on the aisles as they ran down. And so he had invented the geodesic dome and a, which is little bits of triangles all put together and it makes it really, really strong like an eggshell. Um, he had invented this car called the Dymaxion car, which, um, steered from the rear instead of the front and it was designed like an aircraft he built housing that was designed like in an aircraft factory um, he taught how these geodesic things this is what he called it were reflected the atomic structure in nature um, it was an incredible and he would talk in these sentences that were multiple paragraphs more than you know, many times more than mine. 
<laughs> and so it, it, it basically inspired a generation of, of uh, scientists. With that kind of inspiration and with such a compelling need, Mark, why isn't this all happening yet? What is holding us back? What are the obstacles that you see to unleashing this possibility of 2045 of the future that we all dream of? Well, Rhianne Eisler wrote a book called The Chalice and the Blade in which she talked about the cultures around the Mediterranean, which were matrilineal cultures based on cooperation. And she talked about this culture of warriors uh, believed in a dominator god instead of the goddess who came in and took over systematically in three waves of invasions, took over and destroyed that old civilization and replaced it. And that is what led to our culture and our civilization. So we have this class system dominating nature. It was all about uh, racism and dominating, you know, taking whole classes of whole race, races of people and which was a, a concoction and, uh, and dominating them, subjugating them. And I watched it when I was a kid and Jim Crow in the South and during Jim Crow days, I saw it up front and personal. So um, these are the things that have been holding us back. Massively. Well, I'm a big fan of Robert Axelrod's work on the evolution of cooperation and applications of game theory to simulate how humans interact. And he basically states that as long as the rewards payoff matrix favors cooperation, eventually in a repeated interaction with people who can keep track of how you treated me last time, that cooperation and good things manifest as the natural consequence. Are there things that are shifting the game in the direction of these negatives that we can change personally as individuals? Yeah, there are some movements. Like we just had the Bioneers Conference. We just had the transition um, uh, conference transition out of the transition town movement but i think they have a different name for it now there are a lot of movements that are attracting people there are even movements for the rich to stop being so rapacious like the patriotic millionaires and the resource generation which is about uh, giving back and actually giving back the resources to the people who've been stripped um, and the, the other thing is climate change. So we've got, we, you know, basically back in the seven, actually back in the four, in the World War II, there was a woman who said that her uncle was in the uh, intelligence services working on climate change predictions in World War II. So there's no excuse. We knew it institutionally, we knew and now we're facing the music and we have the fires and the floods and everything and the droughts and everything else. So now we're hard up against it and we have to change. And that makes it possible for us to have a market and to do something. And for us to have a market and do something with the kind of technology we're doing it with means that it'll be profitable which means that we can have this money to devote to actually helping people get past the struggle to survive and allow them to thrive in a sustainable way. Well, I was there last century during the ozone hole and I saw humans come together to reduce and eliminate the threat from the ozone hole because I was an engineer at Hewlett Packard and we were told to drive ozone depleting chemicals completely out of the entire supply chain of Hewlett Packard. I know there are many, many companies with a conscience that are intending to drive things in the right direction. Do you see something like the ozone hole scenario possible for the climate <clears throat> change? Not only possible, it's in full bloom. So there are the mayors, there's a whole bunch of things going on. Like there's like three or four different uh, scale groups that Los Angeles is involved in. Mayor Garcetti is a leader of, some, of one of the, um, where the, there are now 
organized cities and even the, the buying collective where the small cities are able to get the buying power of Los Angeles or bigger because they all go in together. This is a global movement. Um, Steve Hawkins uh, wrote a book wrote after he had collected 2 million business cards from his talks all over the world. What he was talking about with 2 million business cards representing 2 million groups of people who had come together either to fight for the environment or to fight for social justice or both. And by now it's way past that. Well, I'm working mostly with Japanese companies and they have an approach of solving problems profitably. Uh, so solving global problems profitably, if we can yeah. make it profitable to transform the earth for the better for all, why wouldn't people do it? Where do you see that playing into what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I mentioned, you know, we're looking at, you know, at, at phenomenal profit levels simply by pricing it at whatever the competition's at or slightly below, then financing the purchases of the people so that they can pay it back with no net negative cash flow by setting the terms of financing for all the things you need to convert away from fossil fuels, you finance it all. And then the savings from what you would have had to pay for maintaining the truck and putting fuel in it and and buying another one every few years um, because the new vehicles are gonna run a million miles. All these different savings stack up and you use those savings to make the payments on the transition for your particular home or business. And that is like a wave that spreads around the planet because in three to five years, you've already paid off all those, all those, those loans with the savings. And now you have something like 25 to 30% of your income available as disposable income for something else. Because the world, the world use of energy costs about, is about 15% of GDP. And in the United States is about 10%. And the world, you, and in wherever people are basically in the middle class or upper class or, upper end of the lower class, people use 15% of their incomes for transportation, especially for buying cars. So if you take those expenses away, because you know, let's say you convert your old car, instead of buying a new one, you convert your old car to battery electric and with a million mile motor in it and million plus mile batteries in it, what's gonna happen? You're not gonna have to pay for another car in 100,000 miles. You're not gonna have to pay for electricity for your home or business. And you're not gonna have to pay for all those repairs to keep an internal combustion engine going. We transform life at a fundamental level within a whole section of life. Or your systems thinker, it's a big complex system. And I appreciate you taking on a little tour of the world in which you imagine. And I hope that we can achieve some of that world together. Why don't you share any final thoughts that you have? Our job here is to help each other bring forth our visions of a better future from early articulation to scaling, to weaving all the threads together into a tremendously strong fabric based on rediscovering what it is to realize our full human potential and shredding and shedding our, well, shred it too, our colonial heritage of domination for true fully functional democracy in service to each other and all our relations. Woo, that is a mouthful, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. We'll open it up now for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. It was both of you, a fantastic job. Um, Mark, I've always been curious, you know, Bucky always said, uh, as have several other people, that uh, when people realize how bad things are, there would be the energy that would allow folks to come together and make the changes that are necessary. But looking at the way we've handled the pandemic, it looks like that doesn't actually occur. So what do you see as ways to really help those folks who want to make change 
overcome the inertia in the system and the resistance in the system so that we can um, indeed move towards this, this better world that we're envisioning for 2045? What are some practical ways that we can do that? I think that we have to take a different understanding of, of the system here and a particularly different understanding of COVID. So General George Armstrong Custer said that merciless assault is the most surprising thing in the world to human beings. Now, where I'm going with that previous president was doing a merciless assault on the world and all in America in favor of his electoral ambitions for re-election. So he basically chose to deny the COVID and to disempower our public health people. He, had, he even before it sprang up, he had pulled the rug out from under the group that, did, that does the work in China um, to help them prevent epidemics because there were things that come out of China a lot. <clears throat> so what I'm saying here is that there was sabotage of the systems that already exist and that these systems have been reconstituting themselves under the next, the, our new president, Biden. And um, so it's a matter of, we get, when the media is corporate and the GOP is taking the strategy of let's divide and conquer, you know, let, let's use let, let's, re, let's basically make people racist, you know, give, give the 35% of population that is racist permission to do it full bore. When we have this sort of thing going on, we're destroying the capacities we have, but these capacities are resilient. Right. It's like each of us is saying, there is a better way, and I know this way mm -hmm. to do the better way whether we're creating it de novo or whether we have learned it over a career. The same thing, it's the will to win for the people. Like there was a guy, there was a shooting at a high school a couple of days ago and it showed and I read about it. And the coach of the home team had acted very effectively to get people protected. And he said, when he realized it was shots, he said, I must protect the people. So, in fact, that's my middle name, Leopold, strong for the people. Um, it's about coming together and saying, no, this will not stand. We work for each other. We work for the life of all our relations. We are related to everything else on this planet. We have responsibility here. We will do it. Stuart, do you have a question? Uh, I do, Kimberly. Hope it, it comes out in a good way because it's not fully formed, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try. Okay. So in, in some sense, Mark, I, I really appreciate you at some foundational level premising all these changes on the profit model. I mean, that was something that I hear underlying your thinking that there's a lot of cost savings that's going to happen and we're going to generate lots of profit. And I, I think that might be a really good thing in terms of uh, transition in the sense that that's a framework that a lot of people think in. However, we're still talking about changing the minds of people to have a more humanistic value, uh, as Bucky Fuller said. Have you thought about how and what systems would help to uh, make that transition so that, you know, essentially what we're, what we're saying is people need to be different at some fundamental and foundational level? Well, a while back, I, I mentioned The Chalice and the Blade by Rian Eisler. Yeah. She followed that up with the partnership paradigm. Right. And she teaches it. But, but that massive profusion of people working for each other or for the environment is a spontaneous, massively parallel processing event going on. So yeah. I like to say, I like to talk about doing a keto on capitalism. I, I came from a different, a, a different kind of reality. 
in, in terms of things I was exposed to and that were values. But then we had the hippie movement. And then, so people learned, we had a whole subculture that was living cooperatively and taking care of each other. And the profit thing is basically creative destruction. So the idea in, in that is used in capitalism is creative destruction. And so we want to creatively destroy the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry and go to distributed ownership of the means of production of energy. So everybody has solar on their roof and a solar canopy over parking if necessary to get the job done. Everybody has electric vehicles. Um, so everybody is able to capture the sun and make and make electricity and get things done. I calculated, I did a spreadsheet for adding factories. And so at the end, by 2030, every year we could add half of the, you know, there's so many factories that every year they could add half again, all the solar energy and battery power needed to power the planet. So at that point, we shut that down. We basically shut those factories down and convert them to some other process since they are either printing presses or ceramic floor tile factories. Initially, they can go back to that kind of work and we can keep a few of them going to do the replacement, you know, to can the ongoing replacement of solar and things. So I have a I have a follow up question from, you know, a world that I've spent a lot of time in the world of conflict it, it it's often said that people aren't are, will not take action until there's enough pain that motivates them and um as i see it today we have we have a lot of conflict between people who want to perpetuate current system and those like us who want to see change um do you foresee some level of great pain uh, as a necessity in terms of a precipitating event? Well, uh, 40 years ago, I would have said there's another way. And I was saying there was another way 40 years ago, but here we are and we already have that great pain. Here we burn the state of Rhode Island worth of California every year now. Here we have, we have basically already disrupted the delicate balance of ecology ecosystems all around the planet. Here we have the sixth mass extinction going on. Here we have sea level rise threatening to disrupt half of the population of the planet. Yes, we've got the pain already. And there are a bunch of things about that. Okay, so let's say the warlords, you know, the like, dominator paradigm, the people that took over the, the civilization around the Mediterranean and, and, and all that. Um, and it's worthwhile reading how they did it in that book. I worked with the Quakers uh, during the Vietnam War. I went to the Center for the Institute for the Study of Nonviolence down in Monterey, in Canary Grove. And they say, that if you want to end wars, make everybody eliminate poverty so that there won't be anybody interested in being recruited by the warlords. That's one big piece. So if we go for prosperity for all without insult to nature, we've covered that base. I know a guy who was a, a park research fellow um, who came up he did his PhD on a, a software program that would be used to manage town halls. You would have town hall meetings, virtual or face to face, and people would basically tell politicians, this is what we want. This is the policy we want. And you get to sign a contract, a legal binding contract with us that says you're going to do it when you get, if we vote for you when you get elected. All right. Do we have any more questions for Mark? It's not a question, but I, I just want to validate the last point that you made, Mark, the notion that um, having more, quote, responsible and thoughtful citizens would be a, a, a key to this transition. And if we, go, if we do the transition with that in mind and notice that Biden is making a really big deal and 
our California legislature make a really big deal about so bringing up the people at the bottom, bringing up the disadvantaged and, and impacted communities, which is perfect. And that's what I want to do anyway. And, and so we can use the principles of capitalism, but we can also use the, the, the restraints on capitalism that the guy who wrote the book back in 1700s w w actually believed in. Because he was operating in the context of a small village or town where everybody knew everybody else and they knew what everyone else is doing. So in other words, we need to uh, shift some of the legal systems of what I'd call the corporatocracy that is, that is just totally impersonal. Well, I think we all could benefit from a more conscious form of capitalism. And if, if the companies that are making profits had to pay the true cost of their impact on society, industries would change overnight. So whenever nuclear power has to start paying to clean up one spill that contaminates the entire earth, there will be no more nuclear power of that type because it would be unprofitable. So let's uh, keep on working for a better future. Any final comments there, Mark? <laughs> no, I've been having fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Roos, let's give him a big hand. Thank you.